thank you, Rajiv. And it's indeed my pleasure to be here among all of you. Um, <clears throat> what I'll try to do is we have about an hour uh, to spend here uh, among us. And in, in my student days, I have been uh, many times sitting on the other side of such lectures. So I try to make sure that the hour that you spend here is worthwhile, it's not boring. We, we can all stay awake and uh, have some interesting uh, dialogue. And uh, feel free to stop me in the middle anytime. If you have any questions, don't wait for the end of the talk. And, and the reason is, you know, because that's the best way I can engage what's going on in your mind so that I can tune my uh, presentation uh, uh, accordingly, right? Otherwise, you know, as you probably know, teachers have an ability to kind of go on and on as long as time is given to them. And I have been a professor in my previous life as well, so I can also go on and on forever. But I want to make sure we cap it within the time and we make it interesting for everybody. Um, uh, actually, uh, though I have sort of come from a very technical background, I decided you know, I'm not going to give a very technical pitch today. It's going to be a bit of you know, technology trends and what's happening out there uh, as far as the technology innovation is concerned. So I'll mix some of the market trends and some uh, my personal experiences of uh, uh, continuing to walk on the entrepreneurial journey, right? So uh, if you have any ambitions down the road along that uh, direction, feel free to, you know, uh, in in interrupt me and ask whatever questions you have, right? Okay, so with that, I will uh, begin. See, uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Wi-Fi, right? You, you, you used it in your, uh, I mean, it's, it's now embedded in every laptop, every cell phone has it, so you can't escape it anymore. But I'll tell you a little story. Sometimes, you know, things in life happen without us really knowing the significance of those developments. So, uh, back in mid-90s, I was a fresh uh, graduate like you. Uh, out of IDK, went to US, did my master's PhD, and after my PhD, I landed up in a group at IBM, and they were building up some wireless local area network. So I said, okay, sounds like an exciting technology, let me join. I also did some piece of work, and had no idea what I was working on, or what this implication is going to be, until in 1999, so I was kind of doing my you know, experiments, testing out technology, and then working through the standards body to get some of those protocols adopted by uh, IEEE and so on. In 99, Intel made an announcement that you know we kind of like this whole concept of local area wireless, and they want to embed it every laptop in the beginning of 2000. So that's when they did the reality hit that you know the, the toy technology we were you know experimenting in the lab is actually going to be everywhere. And I can tell you, as a designer, you can't really fathom and think of every possibility uh, at the time when you're working on something. So if somebody says, claims that you know they had known that, they had figured it out, they had a vision, I don't buy it. Basically, you get into something, you observe, and then you eventually figure out the solutions. You can't have the foresight uh, at the beginning of doing anything. The world is too complex, the place to kind of project so visionaries, in my belief, are you know are defined in retrospective. It's very difficult to tell you know, who's the visionary of today. Only the you know, future will tell us. So, so with that kind of a uh, background, I'll kind of begin. So, Wi-Fi technology, as we know, is very widespread. Uh, it has grown pretty much. You know, if you do the penetration, it will be you know there in about half a billion devices today in the world. And this is a sense of what air type does. What, what we realize is that after internet grew, security became a big issue. After Wi-Fi came into the enterprises, some new dimensions to security started emerging. And what is the new dimension? Well, you, know, you have firewalls, you have you know, intrusion detection system, IPS systems in place, content filters, whatever. There are ways those mechanisms can be bypassed through wireless channels. So it creates a new entry and exit path into the organization. And AirTag is in the business of detecting what those unauthorized entry points are and stopping this kind of intrusion into the corporate network. That's in a sense what we do. And I'll tell you a story of how we can arrive at this value proposition and some interesting anecdotes along the way. 
So, <clears throat> not only talking about kind of just the technology piece, I'll also, in, in, whenever I get an opportunity, give you some interesting anecdotes about how the airtight journey has been happening uh, along the way. So hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, you get some interesting uh, uh, perspective. So roll back your clock uh, like 15 years ago, right? At that time, folks who were sitting in the lab, their vision was that, hey, we already got wired networks. People are connecting desktop computers by ethernets. And you know, won't it be nice if we build a technology which can take the same, pack, the same packets, right? And just transmit those packets over there. So you will have an extension of an ethernet now over there. So people can now roam around, take their laptops and be connected to the internet the same way your desktops are connected, right? Everything will just work. And if you've done some courses in networking, you know the layered networking principle, right? So all, all you're doing is you're changing the lower layers of the protocol. Whatever was going over wire, you are not transmitting the same bits over there. Everything else, IP, TCP, web, everything will just work without any change at all, right? So that was the focus of the group, and that's exactly what we did. At this time, we had no idea what's the implication of this little change on the world at large. And I, and I mean the word, word at large. And I'll, I'll tell you what has happened in the world as a result of a simple change. And nobody in the design team had any clue or had anticipated, you know, what, what would happen as a consequence. I mean, obviously there are some good consequences. People are now mobile, you can do computing, but there are also some dangerous consequences of this. So, what's a dangerous consequence? Well, if you are indiscriminately connecting such devices in your network, Right? You would have a situation where you know, the internal data that was previously confined over the cables can now start leaking out. Right? And you can't really see electromagnetic radiation through your eyes. Right? So if there's a hacker who has a malicious intent can sniff out what's going on and that ability hacker did not have before because you would need a physical access to the network to be able to tap in. But now you can be sitting in the parking lot and sniffing what's going on. Right? So if organizations are indiscriminately deploying this technology without any controls, you could potentially be risking your internal assets, right? And, and, and the beauty of this whole thing is that tools have evolved in the hacker community, and they're, they're, they're known as war driving tools. War driving tools have evolved to a point where you know you just turn them on and you can start seeing, you know, in this building, which Wi-Fi access point is active, what are the security settings, is it open, um, are there some uh, vulnerabilities in it? And interestingly, more than what the IT people themselves know about the infrastructure, the person sitting in the parking lot can find out more, more than that, and exploit those vulnerabilities and attack, right? But obviously, you know, in back in uh, mid '90s, you know, nobody really believed or thought that this would happen. Now, I let me spend five, six minutes just to quickly go over what are some new scenarios that have popped up over the years, and, and then I will go into some implications of it, right? So a very simple scenario, somebody plugs in an access point and it is by mistake misconfigured because you know, there are multiple security settings. You could have open, you can have web encryption, you could have WPA, you can have WPA, PSK and all sorts of things, right? A lot of time people really don't know what those acronyms mean. So they just use default and default setting is open. Open meaning it is just bridging wire network over to the wireless side. So how very simple thing, you know, you buy a box, open it, connect it, it works, and just leave it like that. So, we had done some scans in metro cities, in Mumbai, and uh, Pune, and Bangalore, just you know, drive around in the business districts and catch a signal and see what's going on. What we found, that about 40% of the APs were open. So, people have just connected them to their, you know, internal network, and you can disconnect and get in there. And, and when the little small box sitting, you don't really know how far the signal is going. But at times, it can easily go up to 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. Somebody from the parking lot can very easily catch it. About 42% people are using web encryption. This encryption has been cracked. There are tools available in five minutes, you can get the keys. Only about 18 20% of people are really using the network in, in the right configuration. So, not a very you know, profound. Observation, but in real life, 
The point is, people are uh, deploying this network in a very interesting way at times, risking uh, potential uh, security. The other scenario we've seen, and this is actually the problem in organizations who are very security paranoid. So they have mandated that no violence is allowed in my building. But people have got used to using wireless at home, so they say, well, why am I, why is organization curbing my freedom? I should have ability to use my wireless as much as I want. So if IT is not deploying it, I'm going to bring my own personal device and plug it into the internet and use my own local area wireless network around me. The point is that device that is being plugged in, IT administrator doesn't know about it, and oftentimes it is insecure, and somebody else can gain access to the network through that device if it is not properly secure. So these issue of row access points is uh, very, very common. Do a scan any large organization, and you will find many instances of such devices. And, and this happening because they are very cheap. It's not only India problem, it's a global problem. Go to any, any country and uh, large organization. The bigger the organization, the bigger the problem because you don't, don't know how many Ethernet ports are out there and with how they are protected and, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, previously somebody had to plug in a device to create a Wi-Fi network. With Windows 7, you can, with two mouse clicks, you can convert a laptop into an access point. So you can have a situation where a laptop is connected to the Ethernet. You run the wireless access point and now anybody can come into the laptop and through it be an access point. So just imagine the number of Windows 7 laptops out of the world. Only two clicks is required to convert a laptop into an entry point to the pocket. Right? So for a large organization which has got tens and thousands of employees, how do they really even figure out that this is really not happening? And if it is happening, hacker can easily find out and then gain access. And, and here is an example of a scan. Uh, so I think whenever we go to some organization and tell them, look, um, uh, you could have potentially this problem, they say, well, it's not possible because we have no Wi-Fi policy. So we said, okay, have you done a scan? So this is an example of a scan we did at a Fortune 500 company's office in, in NCR region. Obviously, I'm anonymizing the name. And these are the number of access points we detected in, in their office, just by doing a walk around the facility. So the point is, you know, people are actively using technology in ways which is not necessarily compliant with the IT policies. And People are spending a lot of money protecting their front door, but the back door is very wide open and that they may not be aware of. And here's another example. If you're familiar with the screen, whenever you connect to a Wi-Fi network, when you come back, you would have noticed your laptop automatically connects without you even asking for it, right? So how does it do that? It remembers the networks you've connected to in the past. And every time, whenever your laptop is turned on, it keeps searching for those networks, right? So, if I am a hacker, all I have to do is to create an access point faking that name and a laptop will connect there. Because there is no authentication between, between two, two, two endpoints. And which networks your laptop is scanning for? Run simple tools, hacking tools, and they will tell you these are the MAC addresses of laptops. So we did a scan at Pittsburgh Airport uh, two years ago. In like about five minutes, we found out here are the laptops people are using in the lobby which are the networks that they are looking for. You can find their names. And you can see the names such as Linksys, D-Link, because these are the default SSIDs of the network that you use. You take out of the box, that's the SSID, you put it in your laptop and you connect, right? So if I want to hack any laptop, all I have to do is to create a fake access point with that name, and the laptop will automatically connect. Now I've got a layer 2 connection into that device. I can run all meta exploit, messes, whatever tool I want, and look for what does the ability to exist and attack it. So, in a summary, what I want to say is you know, there are these new dimensions to connectivity which have opened up as a result of the consumerization of this technology and which designers had not anticipated this will happen, but it has happened. So, if I were to summarize the problem of, you know, APs could be misconfigured, problem of, you know, Rogue devices in your network. There's a problem of uh, your clients connecting to you know neighbors potentially because I mean, this is a very common scenario we've seen. That organization has no Wi-Fi, but the neighbor is running an open access point, so you connect. And now your all your traffic is going through the neighbor's network as opposed to going through your internal firewalls. Right? Very very common in intense uh, commercial districts. So, what is the solution? And uh, if you notice, these are the problems you cannot really solve by adding more and more controls into your wiring. You really have to scan the air, see in the air what's going on. Detect who's talking to whom and have some policies and enforce it. 
So essentially what AirTight does is we build a wireless intrusion prevention system. What it does, it's a sensor-like device. It's a scanner. It scans all the channels, figures out you know, who's talking to whom. And then it will block any communication which is not compliant with your security policy. So in a sense, it's kind of having control over your air, only allowing authorized traffic through, banning all the authorized traffic. So it gives you the control over there, right? And that's exactly the purpose of a wireless system. <coughs> So this is the technology we have, been, we have been working on and have built over the years. And obviously we have you know, invested a lot of effort to build a very scalable, large scale solution. Right? You know, if somebody, a Fortune 500 has you know, hundreds and thousands of offices spread throughout the world, you can sprinkle these sensors in those facilities and centrally control them and manage them and have full control over, over the security problems. Now, with this background, I just want to take a pause and, 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 and broach kind of a very interesting uh, question here. So I told you that you know, there exists a problem. As a technologist, you know how to solve it. You exactly know how to package the technology in the boxes. You applied all your uh, technology principles and now the solution is ready. The question is, you know, if you build your solutions, will you be able to go out there in the market and really sell it? Because selling is a totally different ballgame mode. Right? No matter how smart and you know how how you know, superb algorithms are packaged in it, the question is you know do people really care? Right? So the one point I want to convey here that you know in order to really have a success in the marketplace, I mean obviously you have to put in your effort, but there is something beyond that. You have to also get lucky. There are things which need to happen in the market as a whole for you to get an opportunity to go and strike. You as an individual cannot influence market because market is too big a beast for you to do anything. Even if you jump up and down and whatever, market is not going to move as well. So market moves by its own forces and you just have to get lucky. So I'll give you two examples of how in this air type journey we got lucky. So I think back in like 2007, one day we went to our office and we saw this news item. Thank you, breaking news now a major identity breach. Yeah. So interestingly, we were going to all of these retailers and telling them you know, there could be a potential problem in your network, but you know, nobody was really paying attention until Sunday, one day we got lucky that this breach happened. And now everybody is kind of saying, hey, tell us you know, what exactly we are talking about. So, so the point is, security is a kind of a dangerous business. You want people to be secure so that you know, they are safe, but until a break-in happens, nobody really realizes that you actually need a solution like that. So you are trying to do good for society, but at the same time you are hoping that you know something should happen so that you know, people wake up and take notice of what you are trying to do. <laughs> Obviously you can't fund that activity yourself, otherwise you know, uh, that would be a, a, a conflict of interest obviously. But, but this is an example of some things have to happen beyond your control and reach. Otherwise, uh, you may be you know, spending all your time building technology and never, never find, find a potential buyer for it. So, uh, this actually event brought a lot of awareness into the market. And as, as you can understand, as a startup, if you are trying to work with a new idea, you have to anticipate a problem of the future and build a solution for it. If you are building a solution for a problem that exists today, as a startup, you are bound to fail. And the reason is the big players will outsmart you any day, they will have more resources, and you will not be able to compete with them. Right? So the only way you can compete with the big player is if you are doing something beyond where their focus is. Right? But the question is, if you got a solution, how you want to educate the market? So an event like this is educates the market. That, you know, the whole world knows that something has gone on. As with your marketing budget, you will never have reach and ability to go and get the message out to the whole world. You know, there is a problem out there. So you got to get lucky at some point. Now, one incident alone actually doesn't do it because you know very soon people have short memories and then it kind of fades away and other priorities take over. So something else has to happen for it to kind of you know keep the memories fresh. And I'll kind of play a very other interesting uh, um, uh, clip here to, to show you that you know how this Wi-Fi technology and how it has kind of penetrated into the uh, to the home level and how people are kind of making use of it and that awareness is kind of sinking in gradually. So it's a kind of a little bit of an amusing uh, uh, clip but nonetheless uh, it will help me make, make an important point I want to make. 
California. Hi, Jennifer Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yes, hi. Am hi. I on? You are on. Yes. Hi. For over a year and a half in my apartment, I was able to connect through wireless the linkses. Mm -hmm. And that's disappeared now for about three weeks. So I bought the USB. I'm working on this uh, basic on an HP laptop. And so I bought the Linksys wireless extender mm -hmm. with the N standard. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding it's not solved the problem at all. So you have, let me just, silly question. But I'm not asking anyone. You have a wireless access point to begin with. Well, it disappeared, so I'm trying to... But, 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 but you own one, right? No. Okay. No, no I have okay. a wireless piece. Okay. So, so you... Okay. It yeah, wasn't, yeah. wasn't such a dumb question. So, if you want Wi-Fi, you have to contract with an internet service provider. Comcast. Yeah, I know that. What, what? Yeah, Did you do that? I don't do that. No, no. You I were using that. somebody I else? You, yeah, you were using somebody else's Wi-Fi. Not uncommon. Not legal. <laughs> no, no, no. So this person probably caught on and turned it off. But it's not, no, it was the, it was the Linksys in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, oh, they probably Oh, did. Jennifer, it was a neighbor's wireless internet. They, didn't, they set it up and they didn't realize that they were broadcasting it publicly. Okay, well, for over they just that. Well, they, somebody... They caught on, or they moved, or they turned it off, or they renamed it. You you are on an unprotected network. You are in the, doing the most dangerous thing you could do. Yeah. I take this. I do all my banking. I'm taking you, that. You take that risk because you're cheap, Jennifer. You're going to have to buy internet access. This is true. <laughs> I'm sorry. And the and buying the wireless extender is not the solution. You need to get go to an internet service provider and say I want to buy internet access and hook up your own Wi-Fi. It'll work great. Yeah, well, they should bring that cost down. Fourteen ninety five from DSL Extreme a month, but I mean, you know, that's that's like somebody saying, yeah, I uh, I steal uh, from the grocery store because food is so expensive. I, so uh, the point is, you know, some developments of this kind, you know, people are really indiscriminately beginning to use the technology, and the popular media really is giving the message out. Is what has taken, um, I would say, you know, probably seven years for the mainstream IT department to take notice that, you know, this is a problem. Because when we were doing the startup, so we were starting it in 2003, our plan was, you know, it will take us about three years to build it up, and four years, you know, we'll be all golden and we we'll move on to doing other things in life. But what we didn't realize is that, you know, simple message that we understand so well, it will take market probably seven, eight, ten years for it to really absorb and grasp it. And, and if you know, in the Indian market, there was a major uh, incident that happened. That some bomb blast happened in 2008, uh, where you know, some uh, terror emails were sent prior to this blast. They also were sent to some unsecured Wi-Fi connection. And that is what got the home ministry really uh, take notice that this is really an issue, and they got to do something about it. So obviously, as, as a startup back in 2003, we would have never anticipated you know, these events will happen. But uh, in hindsight, uh, they have certainly helped in terms of building up some market awareness. So, if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a business plan, my message to you, you can't really plan for you know, how the market awareness for your new idea will build up. You just have to be get lucky and then hope that you know. But you're persistent. Because there are many companies who went out of business before this event happened because they couldn't survive that long. You just hang in there and now, now they're kind of reaping the benefits uh, of that. So, so in the process we have done obviously a lot of technology innovations and I'll give you a few very, very high level examples of that. Um, back in you know, 2004, the state of the art was that you use a sniffer, you detect how many devices are out there, you can collect their MAC addresses, you can figure out what their names are, what encryption they are using, but that's the level of information you could gather. Um, what we have done, let me, let me jump. We have advanced the technology to a point where not only we can detect all those devices, we can figure out how many of those devices are green, meaning they are secure, they are compliant with your policy, they are on a network and safe. How many devices are orange, meaning they are deployed by you, but they are misconfigured. And the rest are blue devices, meaning they are in the air, but they belong to your neighbor, they are not on your network. 
You don't have to worry about Right? So a very simple value. First you had a list of everything. Now you have a list nicely organized. So you know exactly what I need to worry about. And ignore the rest. Very easy value proposition people to understand. But lot of deep technology and between it to bring this level of simplicity into the information. And we, we, have, we have actually uh, got about 23 patents granted uh, over these years. Uh, the technology which really makes this possible. But when we go to a meeting, we don't explain our you know, fancy technology. We just say, look, you just get, get this green, blue, and red, and orange information, and people get it here. It will make my life simple. So our, our selling uh, proposition has been, you know, uh, security should not be one of the worries. We will take care of it. <coughs> And uh, so essentially the way we do it is whenever we detect some access points in the area, we are able to figure out which ones are um, on a network and which ones are not on a network. So the, the devices which are not on a network will be labeled as blue. Devices which are on a network complying with the policy will get labeled as green. But the devices which are on a network but are not compliant with the policy will get tagged red rogue devices and we will automatically block them. So nobody will be ever able, uh, able to connect to that. The question how does it happen? How are we able to block uh, traffic in the air? It's almost like science fiction. If somebody's trying to send a packet and they're shooting in the air and making sure the packet doesn't go through. It's not like that, but effectively, that's how we explain to the IT and they say, oh, that's cool. I want to try it. But, uh, but exactly, that is exactly the value we deliver. That if, you, if you put a low access point in the network, you will not be able to connect to it. And how we do it? We actually play some games with the Mac layer protocols to actually uh, achieve that idea. So a lot of, lot of R&D research has gone into making that technology uh, bulletproof. And essentially this sensor is what transmits those signals which have the end effect of blocking the communication that is not compliant with your policy. So just like I showed you, you know, we can classify all the access points into the you know, nice red, blue, green categories. Similarly, you can take all the clients including your uh, cell phones, iPhones, uh, Blackberries, and you can nicely categorize them in different ways. Which devices are authorized, which ones are guest devices, which ones are rogue, which ones are external, so you can apply certain policies to those to a bunch of devices. And this level of control and visibility is something that I can consider like. You know, I can tomorrow have a policy that, okay, iPhones are not allowed on my network until uh, I explicitly authorize them, and they will have that ability in control. So, as I told you, we classify all the access points into these green, red, and blue buckets. Similarly, we can classify all the clients into green, blue, and red buckets. And now you can define your policies. You want to allow your authorized devices to talk to authorized access points, but you don't want to allow rogue clients to be able to talk to your authorized access points. Or you don't care if the neighbor's devices talk to their neighbor's access point, I don't care. But if the neighbor's clients start talking to my APs, I want to know and I want to stop it. So essentially this diagram, the matrix that I've shown you, green things should be allowed, blue things should be ignored, and red things should be stopped. That is security policy. And what you need is a system which can automatically enforce this policy 24 by 7. And that's exactly what a wireless IPS sensor does. So simple value proposition for people to grasp and understand and uh, see its value. And once a violation happens, so in fact we are, we are focusing on some very large scale deployments. Large scale meaning companies which have you know, 40, 50, 100 thousand employees, they have a central uh, IT department, they get an alert that there is a low access point somewhere, they want to be able to drill down. So, okay, I get an alert here, click, the alert is from New York, from that building, I click, it's on that floor, that's where the low device is. So, this level of drill down to figure out exactly where the uh, including devices is, is a technology that we have built over, over the years. And <clears throat> so uh, there's a lot which has gone from a technology standpoint to make it work. I'm showing it in a very simplistic manner. But <clears throat> the point is that this technology we had ready even in 2006 and 7. But still, <coughs> we were not seeing the market traction that we really needed. And what we realized is that you know some business innovations were needed as such, alongside technology innovation to really make the whole uh, system work. And what were some of the business innovations? And you know, technologists, when they look at it, they say, hey, this is such a you know 
obvious, simple, stupid thing, and what's the big deal about it? But you know, I tell you, from a market standpoint, it makes a very, very big deal. So I'll give you an example of a few big deal business ideas, which I frankly you know, never put uh, grasp the value of them until the revenue started coming in. So a very simple idea. Previously, we used to sell sensors and servers. And the idea was, you, know, you will install servers, sensors, and you will manage the whole system yourself. In 2008, we said, well, we will take all the servers and host them in the cloud, in the net, on the internet. So customers don't have to worry about managing the servers at all. All they have to do is to sprinkle these devices, turn them on and done. The devices will automatically connect into the cloud, and we will take care of configuring, managing them for them. And people found that a huge value because they really didn't have trained people to be able to do all that configuration stuff themselves. Now it was very simple for them. Just plug it in and it works. Technology has exactly the same architecture, same protocols, everything is the same. It's just that you have physically moved the server box from the customer premises into that. That's it. And a big, big uh, change uh, in terms of how people perceive, perceive that solution. The another interesting thing we noticed we created a packaging which had this box and some antennas and we created a one page manual that you take the, open the box, plug the device out, take the ethernet cable, plug it in and you are done. That's it. You don't have to ever log into the device to do any configuration at all. So here is an example of a real life deployment where you know the person who actually runs the retail chain uh, transaction, uh, the person who kind of does the cleaning of that facility, that is the person who installed this device into their IT infrastructure. He took the box out, saw that one page manual with the graphics, plugged it in and the system was online. So why is it a big deal? Because we now have customers who have 12,000 such retail stores throughout the United States. They just don't have people to send to each store and IT administrator will go and configure devices. We ship these boxes by FedEx. The box arrives, where's the store guy, puts it out, plugs it in, and the system works. Big, big differentiator. So when we're competing against Cisco and Motorola, we won the business because their boxes could not be plugged in like this and made to work while our box could be. And that was the only reason why customer bought it. They didn't really care what other algorithm and sophistication exists. Because this is the biggest pain point for them. And when we realized that distributed large scale deployments of these technologies is where the real pain point is, we kind of realized that you know, there are uh, markets such as you know, retail, hospitality, um, hotspots, where you know, operators are rolling out hotspots in you know, hundreds and thousands of numbers. There are enterprises who have you know, hundreds and thousands of branch offices. When they do a rollout at corporate wide level, they really need a plug and play solution. And, and uh, likewise, for small medium businesses, if you want to serve them uh, from a network operation center. And the architecture that some of the bigger vendors have, that you have to plug in devices and have these big giant controllers who have to be configured and managed to be able to serve those networks, is really not <coughs> the right match for the needs of those market segments. While if you have something like cloud based where everything is hosted in the cloud, you just turn on these devices, they automatically find their mothership in the cloud and connect and get configured, is really something that the customers really want. And then we kind of realize that. We also decided, and I think I will not go into this slide, but there are benefits to the cloud based hosting in these markets. So what we did is, previously this box used to be only security sensor, now we have also added an access point. So if you want to do a rollout of Wi Fi hotspot, tens and thousands of locations. Uh, we can do it in a much uh, lower cost and much more seamlessly than anybody else out there. And this simple uh, observation uh, and alongside we change the model. Instead of you know a full capex down payment you do a pay as a go subscription model, uh, break the functionality to a different module, only pay for you know the starting capability pay something more for an added capability and so on, and introduce some disruptive pricing in the market. This all that was needed to kind of get the whole uh, business machinery going. Exactly the same technology, just a different way of packaging it. 
And, and, and since then, what we have seen, when we started doing this thing, suddenly the bigger giants woke up. They figured out that you know, we are building some of the big accounts and businesses, so there must be something going on. And now they are beginning to copy the, our, our model of selling in, in those markets. And we are seeing that we are sort of as much as a market leader. Though we are a very small company with only 100 people, but we have been able to influence the strategy to see in some of the bigger giant companies because the way we kind of package and have a market very technology. So the proof is actually in the pudding that now over you know thousand plus customers around the world in some very very big names currently are protected by AI right? and they have done a global uh, deployment um, uh, covering all of their offices uh, all, all those stuff. So <clears throat> The two, three quick things I'll actually touch upon briefly and then we'll conclude and maybe open up the hour for some, some interesting questions. Um, see, one of the things that I you know, take pride in, in airtime all about that uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technology company which has done entire engineering in Pune and we are uh, sort of selling our solution to the global market and this has only been possible because we have been able to innovate at, at the global level. And, and I, when I came into a, a new campus uh, this afternoon, I think two things which kind of struck my core is the focus for green initiative that has been taken by the campus. Because I'm a big green uh, uh, person myself, and uh, sincerely believe, you know, in, in the, in the, in the uh, culture of innovation. I think you know, innovation is absolutely required to emerge, step up the plate beyond a national to the international level. So I'm glad that you know that the culture or the focus of innovation is being inculcated here. And um, I would certainly you know, encourage all of the young guys here to take, sort of be more risk takers in their life. Especially in the early years. Early years when you don't have any liabilities, you can afford to take risks. And uh, if you don't take risk in the first you know, 10 years after your graduation, you'll never take it in life. Or I would say never, but the chances that you'll take a risk in the later part of the life uh, are exponentially decaying. Um, uh, so, you know. And, and, and uh, especially if you're thinking of a new idea or trying to innovate, you will never know the complete picture. You just need to kind of jump in and figure things out. And if you're smart enough, you'll figure it out. So uh, oftentimes people sort of wait because until I kind of fully grasp the whole thing and then I will enter. That, that state will never come because the market is moving too fast, you will never be able to understand anything completely ever. So all you need is you know, jump and then figure, figure things out. So, uh, I'm actually yeah, glad to kind of share some of the accomplishments that, you know, AirTai uh, had scored uh, um, in this journey. So, for example, in 2009, we were actually ranked on the top 10 security companies globally. Uh, this, this award we got. La, um, 2009, we were actually awarded by NASCOM uh, as the most innovative company which has an engineering center in India. So, this is the entire AirTai team which is, you know, operating out of Pune. So, everybody was kind of happy to get there, you know, first recognized. Uh, this is actually fresh. Uh, recently, Gartner is an analyst that uh, does market uh, research of new trends uh, in the technology space. And they have ranked us consistently at the top and four years in a row. And in fact, this year, uh, this is kind of ranking they publish on the wireless inclusion prevention space. And uh, you will notice that they have actually ranked us above uh, Aruba, Cisco, uh, of the world. And you can understand how giant these companies are, right? So it's indeed, uh, um, uh, I think they're kind of happy that finally, you know, the effort we put in has finally got understood and recognized. Huh? And the only way you can get this ranking is if you have some market success to prove. So when you start big, winning big accounts, that's the only way you can prove your net worth, uh, no matter how much uh, uh, technology and stuff you invite nobody cares, until you can show that there are people out there who are really willing to put money on the table to, to buy a technology. So they're happy to end up here, at least. Uh, but it has been a, eight years of grinding before we got to this point. And, and when we started, there were about 11 companies funded in this market, out of which nine went out of business, only two survived. One got acquired by Motorola two years ago. We are the only company now standing alone in a profitable business. And uh, good is, news is that the market is picking up, and now we've got an entry into the access uh, space as well, which is a very uh, moving uh, so, uh, uh, along the course, I think, as I mentioned, we have had a culture of innovation in the company. And we've also discovered some very interesting uh, new findings about 
the Wi-Fi protocols and the vulnerabilities. And we have a culture where uh, our researchers take those findings and publish into the global uh, marketplace. So these are some of the new attacks that our research team discovered. And we uh, published these attacks at Black Hat RSA conferences. And some of these uh, publications actually got a lot of publicity uh, internationally. So for example, CBS News actually did a news story on one of our findings that we did in 2007. I'll just quickly play it in the wrap of my presentation. And the people in, in this video are all here. Well, the next time you hand your credit card to a store clerk, a thief may be electronically eavesdropping on that transaction. A new study shows the wireless data system stores use to transfer customer data is wide open to hackers. As Tony Rissolano shows us, that same wireless security breach could give thieves easy over the keys to your company's secrets. But that iPhone you always have with you might as well be an open invitation to thieves to take what they want. In fact, any device that uses a Wi-Fi wireless connection and travels with you in and out of the office is a prime target for a new hacker tool called Cafe Latte. <laughs> It's called Cafe Latte because in the time it takes you to come to a coffee shop with Wi-Fi access, order a latte, and sit down, a hacker sitting across the room can impersonate your office network, causing your device to connect to the hacker automatically. There is no way for your laptop to really know whether it's connecting to your office network or to some imposter such as a hacker. Once connected, it takes the Cafe Latte program about three to five minutes to learn the encryption key for your company's network. Meantime, you sip your coffee unaware that anything is wrong. Latte was good. Unfortunately, I came to that hot topic of cracked web. Web stands for Wired Equivalent Privacy. Actually, that's all. I think the point I want to convey is that no, this was an R&D work with Zayn Pune. Got prime time news coverage in, in, in US series channel. And the people you saw are all, you know, in twice sitting in Pune. Right? So they're, they're now celebrities in the US market, but you know, people across the street don't know who they are. <laughs> So I think I just want to kind of wrap up at this point that um, hopefully I've kind of you know, given you some very, very uh, high level 50,000 foot view of um, how a, where you start from, where you finally end up with, and, and what kind of effort and uh, pragmatic approach you have to kind of take to kind of get there. I wouldn't say we have still finished our journey, yes, our journey is still on. But uh, the interesting part has been that the journey has been a very enjoyable one. There's a lot of up and down. Uh, for example, when we started 2004, and then we made all the promises to our VCs that you know, we will give you so much of return so many down the road, nobody had imagined that there will be a global meltdown in between which will affect your plans. Uh, but you know, you face it, you deal with it, and then you kind of move on. Uh, so life is kind of full of uncertainties, you can never break them. It's basically how you ride those waves as they come is where the fun lies. So I think the journey has to be a lot of fun. And result, you really can't predict and then see where exactly is going to go. So I think at that point, I'll stop. And any questions, I'll be more than happy to take. The case for us is that there are already hackers who out there who can do that, right? So if you really want to do it, you don't want to buy an expensive technology to do it. You can buy some you know, uh, free downloadable software to do it yourself. And the reality that people are doing it, right? So you need technology to be able to detect if that is happening and be able to do a counterweight. So this is, a, security is always like, you know, a never ending war. And that's why it's a good business to be in, because you know, it's never done. Every year you need a new release, a new patch to go beyond the technology. I, I, I don't kind of mind it, because I think it keeps a lot of people busy. It's better than, you know, going on the street and shooting guns to kind of write software and do counter attack over there. So it, it generates all the employment, it, it consumes a lot of mind, and you know, it pushes the frontier of technology. But you're right, it can be done, and there are hacking tools out there. You do a search, you find them. 